Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session. I have the pleasure of introducing you to the leader of today's um, session dealing with climate despair, Jennifer Atkinson. Jennifer is a senior lecturer in environmental studies at the University of Washington and creator and host of Facing It, a podcast exploring the emotional toll of our climate crisis. Jennifer's undergraduate seminar on climate grief and eco-anxiety was one of the first college courses of its kind in the U.S and has been featured in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, NBC News, the Seattle Times, and Gris. Jennifer is also the author of the book, Garden Land, Nature, Fantasy, and Everyday Practice. She has a PhD in English from the University of Chicago and has taught at the University of Washington for the past 11 years. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for, for joining today. Um, and I'm gonna be screen sharing in just a moment here. I've got notes open on one screen and PowerPoint on another and, um, and then the chat running. So I usually don't monitor the chat while, while I'm talking um, just because it's a little bit distracting. So if something like really monumentous comes up or important, like you can't see me anymore, you can't hear me, you can just unmute yourself. And I think the organizers or the facilitators will be doing that as well. But. Um, what, what I'm going to do is um, uh, talk for about 30, 35 minutes, um, share some, some material and some slides, and then we're going to have some breakout rooms where you can discuss some of the things that come up during this talk um, amongst each other. Um, and that, that's basically the structure of what we'll be doing here. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And hopefully you can all see my opening slide here. Let me know if there's any, any problem with that. Um, so I wanna start actually um, uh, by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from Seattle, which is on the occupied land of the Duwamish people. Um, I am a professor of environmental studies at the University of Washington, where I've taught for the past 11 years. And I'm going to share a little bit about how I first got involved, oops, first got involved in this topic of eco-anxiety. So I thought I would read a short excerpt from one of my podcast episodes that introduces this personal story. And while I'm reading, I'm going to share some slides that help tell the story of some of the ways that I've traumatized my own students um, in the process of teaching about climate change. And that's not to critique the focus on difficult material, which is simply unavoidable in climate work. But this excerpt and images may be a good reminder of um, how we often end up in a place of despair. So this is from, oops, from my podcast. And the slide's going. A student of mine wants commented that if the university could monitor the collective pulse rate in environmental courses, they'd station medics in our classrooms. Given the way I facilitated courses during my first 10 years as an educator, such a measure may have been prudent. Like so many of my colleagues, I taught about climate issues by feverishly pulling items from the bottomless grab bag of ecological horrors and tossing them indiscriminately into students' laps like emotional grenades mass extinction and dying oceans, community displacement and melting ice caps, planetary arsonists elected to high office, the suffering of frontline communities, starving wildlife, burning forests, rising seas, and a diminished world for all who will come after us. However, it was exceedingly rare in those early days of teaching for me to pause and ask students how this material made them feel. In fact, I typically did my best to avoid this question because when we did wander into that murky emotional terrain, someone would end up in tears or find themselves unable to speak or start trembling with rage or grief. I took it for granted that such moments detracted from learning and steered around those quote unquote digressions and breakdowns so we could get back and focus on the quote unquote real content. I'll admit, however, that I was also seeking to protect myself. I felt emotionally and spiritually depleted by the outrage and heartbreak that can become a daily poison drip 
for those aware of society's relentless environmental and social justice assaults. How could I manage to keep teaching climate issues across the decades when I myself felt so overwhelmed by grief? <clears throat> so this is partly what led me to think more carefully about what the emotional impacts are the emotional impacts of our climate crisis, especially as I was seeing more and more students struggling with anxiety or falling into hopelessness or despair over the years. And that was more concerning to me than my own grief because I'd made it into my 40s and established myself in an environmental career. But I was deeply troubled about what would happen if the next generation of climate leaders burned out or retreated into apathy. That prospect just seemed incredibly alarming. Um, and it also made me question why students were primarily learning about the physical impacts of this crisis, so that the external damage. But as educators, we weren't helping them address the landscape of damage that we're all carrying around inside of us. Those invisible traumas that we internalize from witnessing or experiencing firsthand so much destruction of life. And our neglect for those emotional impacts isn't just a fault of the physical sciences. This is a reflection of our larger society, which by and large is not a culture that openly mourns non-human losses. And that makes it really hard to fully process their, their personal impact or even to recognize that they exist because for a very long time, many of us didn't have the language to talk about this. That has changed in recent years with a rising popularity of terms like climate anxiety, eco grief, or climate despair. And it's not just climate activists who've adopted this language. The American Psychological Association put out a major report in 2017 documenting this mental health crisis. They define eco anxiety as a chronic fear of environmental doom. Symptoms can range from sleep disorders and substance abuse to chronic depression and anxiety. Uh, climate psychology has also become a new field in recent years with therapists seeing more and more patients with eco-anxiety and depression. Uh, earlier this year, reports were coming out of Australia of a mental health crisis in the wake of the bushfires. And by the way, just a decade earlier, Australia had suffered through the longest drought ever recorded on the continent, which devastated farmers' crops and livelihoods. And studies of that disaster showed a spike in depression, alcoholism, domestic violence, and suicide among farmers. And this here is from researcher Stephen Running, who's mapped our responses to environmental loss onto the classic five stages of grief. This five-stage model is pretty common. I've seen different versions of it everywhere. Some psychologists have critiqued this, but even if, it, even if it doesn't map out in this tidy linear fashion, I bet everyone here has experienced some of these stages at some point. Denial, anger, depression. So what I'm gonna do is give examples of four different groups that are experiencing climate grief, and then a few insights that we might take from each of them. So the first group are students and young people. And this is the group I know best because over the past 10 years of teaching, I've watched them fall farther and farther into despair. On this slide, there are some quotes from the very first day of one of my own classes. Students are telling me that they're having nightmares about water wars and climate refugees and mass extinction. Some have said they're not gonna have kids because they're afraid of sentencing them to live through a climate apocalypse. And many are very angry at older generations that are handing them this mess. This meme was posted recently by Jamie Margolin, the 18 year old Colombian American climate justice activist um, and founder of Zero Hour. And I think it really captures the frustration of her generation being told by leaders how inspiring they are and that they're gonna grow up and change the world when those leaders are in power right now. And yet they're not taking that responsibility. And the coronavirus pandemic is only exacerbating that intergenerational resentment. 
Again, Margolin has commented on how youth are being asked to make sacrifices and forego all these rites of passage like prom and graduation to protect predominantly older people. And yet that older generation has not reciprocated when it comes to climate threats. And so in this article here, she writes, my generation is giving up our youth, our schooling, our fun and our freedom so that you can see next year. When this is over, you may have to give something up so that we can see next century. And it's not just Gen Z, but also millennials like Mary Heglar, um, another activist who's written really powerfully about the way that her generation's climate despair is now being amplified by the coronavirus and overlaps with many of those um, justice issues. Then the second group I'd highlight are scientists. Uh, environmental scientists suffer some of the highest rates of eco depression and despair, which isn't surprising since they're documenting the disappearance of our natural world up close. Um, if coral reefs or rainforests or some species of wildlife is your entire life's work, then watching it die can be traumatizing. Um, Catherine Wilkinson is one of the senior writers of the book Drawdown, and she once said, quote, there is no way for me not to have a broken heart on most days. But scientists are in another unique position that makes it harder to cope with the emotional impacts precisely because their field puts so much emphasis on objectivity and detachment. So there's the stigma around discussing subjective or emotional responses. And many scientists are concerned about compromising their professional credibility by appearing too emotional. Then the third group of um, uh, suffering from this existential crisis is all of the communities on the front lines of climate disruption who are experiencing direct impacts and harm. And as always, it's the poor and overwhelmingly black indigenous and communities of color that are suffering the heaviest impacts and the worst emotional toll from climate assaults. Hurricane Katrina is a really classic example, simply because it's been so extensively researched. The APA reports that one in six people impacted met the diagnosis for PTSD and suicide or suicidal thoughts more than doubled for displaced people in New Orleans, which makes sense because those black and low income neighborhoods are already um, suffering from inadequate access to affordable housing, and healthcare and emergency services, not to mention mental health services. Um, and that makes it so much harder to recover from climate disasters. For many indigenous people, the warming climate is wiping out traditional hunting and cultural practices, especially in the Arctic where it's preventing people from traveling to ancestral sites because the landscape is melting beneath them. Suicide has risen significantly in those communities People say their cultural identity is being devastated. Um, in almost every talk I think I've ever given on this topic, I've included this quote from an Inuit woman that just really powerfully captures that cultural and spiritual erasure, where she says, Inuit are people of the sea ice. If there is no more ice, how can we be people of the sea ice? And of course, this is just the latest chapter in a long history of colonialism and racism. And for that reason, climate injustice is, is magnifying past traumas. Um, and these are exactly the kinds of connections we see when we recognize the intersections between um, climate crisis and um, the broader crisis of in inequality and mental health, especially in this moment of pandemic, which has put a magnifying glass on everything that was already unjust and dysfunctional about white supremacy and capitalism. Um, in addition to extreme weather events that I mentioned, communities of color have long been suffering from the, the slow violence of incremental environmental harm. So they're more likely to be downwind from smokestacks and downstream from hazardous waste flows or living next to coal fire plants and hazardous waste sites. Uh, nearly one in three black people live within 30 miles uh, of a coal fired power plant where asthma rates are astronomical. And so then along comes the pandemic where the death rate for black people is 2.3 times higher than white Americans. And studies have shown one important factor behind that is that even a moderate increase in community air pollution, 
which is mostly from fossil fuel burning, can lead to significant increases in COVID-19 death rates. And Black and Latino communities living downwind from those smokestacks have already spent a lifetime absorbing a bigger dose of that pollution. So 2020 has just become this critical flashpoint amplifying the intersections of our climate crisis, the racial disparities of the COVID pandemic, and of course, state violence against Black people. Um, three forms of structural injustice that are expressed very vividly in that image of suffocation and the words, I can't breathe. The last words, um, George Floyd spoke as he was suffocated by the police, the experience of BIPOC whose um, lungs shut down from COVID-19 and, and their everyday experience of not being able to breathe or thrive in their polluted communities under the violence of climate change. So grief within the black community then becomes another manifestation of that suffocating experience of structural oppression, um, as I think is really captured by this headline, and this was from um, um, uh, a colleague here in Seattle. Then the final group that's suffering from climate anxiety is actually everybody, conservative, progressive, climate deniers, and hardcore activists, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, everybody's daily life is changing in a thousand subtle ways. And this can go undetected from the narrow perspective of the immediate present. But as soon as you get people to start talking about the past or how things are different from when they grew up, they will tell stories of slow moving changes like the loss of bees and songbirds disappearance of trees that they used to see while they were driving to work, or those annual fishing trips where they come back with less and less every year, or nights outside where you can't see the stars because of wildfire smoke. And this photo here is from where I live in Seattle from the fires um, a couple summers ago. All of that adds up to a deep and very personal sense of loss. So this is what philosopher Glenn Albrecht calls solastalgia. And he's playing on the concept of nostalgia, uh, a longing for a time or a place that you can't go back to. But solastalgia happens while you're still at home. So it's the pain of watching your surroundings become unfamiliar. So he defined the condition as a homesickness experienced without ever leaving home. And again, solastalgia is not just an affliction of well-to-do environmentalists. In parts of coal country like West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, scientific studies have shown that rates of clinical depression are significantly higher in areas with mountaintop removal than in other coal mining areas in the very same regions. So the quote on this slide is from a Virginia resident uh, commenting on her depression after the surrounding landscape was demolished by mountaintop removal. Okay, so that's a snapshot of some different ways that eco-anxiety and grief are expressed. Um, I wanna shift a little bit now and say a few words about how we typically think about grief and how we might reframe the experience of climate grief in more empowering ways. Um, I've been exploring this in that question in my new podcast, Facing It, and the first six episodes are available um, on any podcast app or on my website. Um, in a nutshell, facing it looks at how grief might actually be a valuable resource for us in the fight for climate justice. So I'm gonna read a, a two minute excerpt from one of the episodes that picks up where I left off in reading that story from the beginning of my talk. When I first launched my, my seminar on eco-anxiety, I was every bit as distressed as my students and looking for ways to extinguish my grief for all this suffering. But something unexpected happened along the way. I had always thought of grief as a bad thing, a dark state to avoid or overcome as quickly as possible. I thought that feeling grief was like succumbing to a preventable illness or that once it took hold, I might fall into a bottomless hole of despair. But in time, it dawned on me that maybe we were seeking solutions to the wrong problem. We all wanted to fix the way we felt so we could go back to feeling happy, 
But grief isn't something to be fixed because it's not dysfunctional. It's a healthy and necessary process we have to undergo in order to heal. In fact, grief can be a tremendous source of wisdom as we move into an uncertain climate future. I know this may sound controversial in a moment when environmentalists are urging us to focus on hope, but the two are not mutually exclusive. And for many people, grief may be an even more powerful force for transformation. First, grief isn't just one of many options for accepting loss. Grief is the process of accepting loss. I get why many people working towards sustainability want to sidestep emotional issues and push the public straight into action. The situation is urgent and dwelling on our feelings can seem like an extravagance as the fires close in. But the problem is when we try to jump straight to the final step without first processing the emotional toll of all this lost beauty in life, we're bypassing the very insights that motivate us to fight for our world in the first place. Ignoring ecological grief is like trying to rush through any great loss, a job, a home, someone you love, without pausing to acknowledge what you're leaving behind. In all those cases, we're not just losing something we once had, we're also losing the future many of us had counted on. We can't act creatively and honestly in this new reality if we still believe we're living in the old one. And most of us are stuck in a pre-climate change fantasy realm, clinging to delusions that our world in coming years will still be the world we imagined growing up. Denial isn't just a description for people who reject the science. It describes university professors like me and scientists who devote their lives to studying climate change and activists fighting to keep things from getting worse. We understand the problem intellectually, but we don't live as though we do. We accept the facts, but we haven't felt our way through what those facts mean, how our lives, how all lives will be undone in some way. We're like the person who knows a loved one is dead, but hasn't let that reality penetrate to their core, where it will reorganize all the ways they relate to the past and future and determine all they'll have to let go of. <clears throat> So that excerpt is from the second episode, but as the podcast progresses, I'm also trying to push beyond just reframing grief as something that's not bad to also consider ways that it's actively good. And I wanna be clear if it wasn't already obvious that if you logged into this talk hoping I would share some insight that would make your grief go away, you may be disappointed because that's not what I'm going to do. First, I don't have the power to do that without diluting or brainwashing you. Um, but second, even if we could, my argument is we probably wouldn't want to because grief can be deeply transform transformative and beneficial towards moving um, or, or mobilizing meaningful social change and climate action. And there are three reasons I would make that claim. First is that grief arises from deep attachment and connection. It is a sign of love for our world. I always remind my students, you will not grieve for something you don't love. So even though it's often unconscious, grief is a way of honoring and affirming our connection and empathy with other species. It's a response that arises out of the recognition that our existence and well-being are entwined with other lives. This is an insight that is so disastrously missing from our entire modern worldview and way of life under consumer capitalism. But the act of remembering how intimately our lives are bound up with others is going to be key to our collective survival and liberation. So the takeaway here is we shouldn't think of grief and love as opposites, but actually two sides of the same coin. And Seattle artist Chris Jordan has written, um, as I've included on this slide, that when we try to be cheerful and suppress our grief for the world, we're also suppressing our love for it. And I, I want to expand on this point for a moment because it offers some important insights um, for the ongoing debate in climate circles over how we motivate people to act. This is just a perennial question, like what's the most effective affect 
in getting people to respond? Is it fear or hope or anger or guilt? And if you look at environmental communication in recent years, there's been an overwhelming focus on hope as the key to political action. But a lot of thoughtful scholars point out that hope can be a way of deferring action onto the future or onto other people. And hope can let us off the hook by luring us into a false sense of comfort that everything will turn out in the end. And I wanna be clear, this debate about hope is incredibly complex and it's much more nuanced than I have the time to explore right now. I actually have multiple podcast episodes exploring different versions. So active hope, critical hope, intrinsic hope. What I'm referring to here is that easy version of hope that can quickly become, I hope someone else fixes this. And that's what Derek Jensen is criticizing in this quote on the slide. I am definitely not saying that pessimism is a winning strategy, but we've got to remember that hope is not the end game. We have to be like disciplined in asking ourselves what we really want. And for me, getting people to act is infinitely more important than getting them to feel hopeful. Greta Thunberg put this really eloquently in her speech um, before the World Economic Forum recently, where she said she doesn't want us to have hope. She wants that our actions will result in hope. And on this slide, Emily Johnson is also warning us about you know, getting tangled up in psychological distractions that are just about feeling good, rather than committing ourselves to acting on behalf of justice and our obligations to each other. So she says that even in a hopeless state, um, we still have the chance to make the space for hope, to act in such a way that hope might exist for others who come after us. So this is where I come back to, to grief um, because grief is by definition a function of love, while hope is not. You know, you can feel hope without love. I hope there's a parking space open, or I hope my team wins, or my Twitter post gets retweeted. But you cannot feel grief without love. That's what grief is. And I think that love is far more powerful in motivating us to fight than any other affect. There's just no limit to the lengths that, that we will go to protect what we love, even if we don't feel like we have hope. When someone you love is terminally ill, you don't stop acting on their behalf just because their situation seems hopeless. You do whatever you can, the odds be damned. Then the second positive aspect of eco-grief is that it breaks down boundaries that we've created between ourselves and other species, as well as other humans. We live in a culture where some lives matter and others do not. Some deaths receive elaborate tributes and mourning rituals, while others are trivialized or ignored. And of course, groups like Black Lives Matter, people seeking justice for mur murdered indigenous women, and trans and LGBTQ activists know firsthand how this absence of public grief dehumanizes them, uh, which is why they deliberately use public protests and vigils to ensure that those deaths aren't pushed into the shadows. That refusal to protect ourselves from the pain of witnessing other species death is an act that some scholars identify as resistant mourning which consciously chooses to hold on to feelings of grief and pain to spur a sense of responsibility for this loss. And then that connects to a third point that many indigenous scholars have made about grief as a way of confronting the legacy of climate colonialism. So I like the example from Ron Reed, who is from the Karak tribe in California He's written about how his tribe, like so many other indigenous people in North America, considers plants and animals and land as sacred relatives, which inevitably leads to grief when they're destroyed. But, and, and this is a quote from his essay, he writes, because the dominant non-native society does not recognize the deep emotional ties that we describe between humans and the natural world, karak grief and other emotions related to their loss is invisible. 
And that invisibility and lack of legitimacy compounds the harm done to Indigenous people. This is referred to as disenfranchised grief, a loss that is experienced but can't be openly acknowledged or publicly mourned. Okay, so from here, I want to turn to some strategies um, for um, navigating climate grief and anxiety. But please keep in mind those three insights I just shared, that the goal is not to extinguish grief, but rather to channel it towards more meaningful social transformation. So tip number one is to acknowledge it. Basically everything I just covered is a form of acknowledging our distress. If you're like me and you lie awake at night imagining the end of the world, just hearing yourself say that out loud makes it more manageable. Many of you probably know this saying from neuroscience, if you can name it, you can tame it. Um, and one of the reasons this openness is especially important when it comes to anxiety and grief around climate issues is precisely because both the cause and the emotional impact remain so unacknowledged in public life. When we barely have a vocabulary to even name this condition, of course it's going to seem irrational or deviant. And you also hear a lot of climate activists say that they feel intense pressure to always project hope and optimism. And of course, hope-based communication is strategically important. We all understand that. But I think the climate community can go too far in policing expressions of these darker emotions. And that can end up backfiring when you consider that suppressing feelings of sadness or anger leads to much bigger problems down the road. That's where you end up with chronic depression, substance abuse, rage. There's extensive research showing how um, those outcomes result from repressing our emotions. Then number two, talk about it. I already mentioned that hearing yourself talk out loud about dark feelings is itself therapeutic, but the benefits are social as well. Um, one of the ongoing questions in climate work is, why aren't more people taking action and demanding change? And our typical assumption is, well, the public doesn't care or they don't understand the science, but research shows that that is not true. In national polling, almost 90% of Americans believe climate change is happening, and 62% identify as being concerned or very worried, according to the most recent surveys coming out of the Yale program on climate communication. But even though we're carrying this fear and concern around in our hearts and minds, we live in a culture of climate silence, especially here in the US. People do not talk about this. And we, we might think that they do because we're part of the climate community, so we're doing it and talking about it all the time. But you go outside of those circles, and that is not a point of conversation. And that makes it seem less urgent or less likely that we'll see ourselves as the ones with agency and responsibility. Instead, we assume that, that scientists or politicians are going to be the ones to deal with it. And that is extremely problematic for the simple reason that we are social creatures. Evidence-based psychology shows that having conversations and social interactions is the driving force for behavior change. Whether we're interacting at workplaces or schools or sports events or on social media, we look around and we take our cues from each other. And when climate change never comes up, it reinforces a socially constructed denial. George Marshall's book, which I've highlighted here on the slide, um, Don't Even Think About It, is brilliant on this subject. I highly, highly recommend it. But then on a more personal level, you know, a huge part of the depression and anxiety in response to environmental issues comes from feeling alone and isolated. And when you feel isolated, you are not empowered to take action. But just the act of talking about emotional responses helps create a sense of community and solidarity. So when I resurveyed my students at the end of the quarter, they said over and over again that the single most helpful thing about taking my seminar was being in the room with others talking about the same struggles and being heard when they voiced distress. 
So the takeaway here is we have to get rid of this binary thinking about talk versus action or that we need less talk and more action. This is really misleading. Talk is action. Okay, then number three, get outside or make time for other forms of self-care, whatever that means for you. I use being outside because that's really helpful for me. Um, and I'm sure everybody's seen a headline at some point about the research showing that time spent outside enhances mental health and well-being. And people who've been successful in environmental activism over the long term draw strength from their connections to nature and to community as well. But most activists are notoriously bad at giving themselves breaks. We feel like we have to attend every meeting or volunteer event or protest, and then we feel guilty when we don't show up. But self-care is exactly the kind of work that equips us to be social change agents. And it helps us avoid burnout so that we can stay engaged over the long haul. We've got to remember that the climate battle is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I love Maya Angelou's reminder here, where she writes, every person deserves a day away in which no problems are confronted, no solutions searched for. On that day, we need to withdraw from the cares, which will not withdraw from us. Uh, and then just as importantly, being in nature reminds us why it's worth fighting for climate solutions in the first place. The world is still a beautiful place and there is still so much left to protect. And Rachel Carson once said, the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. And then the final tip you probably all saw this coming, is to take action. Action is the best antidote to grief. There is nothing more therapeutic. It's action, I say, that gives rise to hope and not the other way around. And I, I don't say this in like the naive sense of believing that me planting trees or going to a climate protest is going to solve the problem. The real power here is, in, is that getting engaged helps us build solidarity. And again, one of the main reasons that people feel hopeless or depressed in the face of this threat is they think they're alone in their concern. And when we feel isolated, we're just not going to step forward to act. So cognitive psychologists really put a lot of emphasis on how important it is to think of ourselves as part of a team. And that mode of thinking also counteracts the, the very widespread concern that our actions are too insignificant to matter, right? Why even bother? My students hit this wall all the time. They feel, they feel helpless because their impact seems so minuscule and is just totally dwarfed by the scale of the crisis. But if we see ourselves as working collectively rather than individually, we can recognize that all contributions sync up with a larger network of change. This is what Adrienne Marie Brown calls emergent strategy. It's a movement that spirals out from all kinds of small local actions and connections to create complex systems. Economist Donatella Meadows makes a similar point when she reminds us to think about um, leverage points where a really small shift in one thing can produce big changes in everything. And there's one example I love from Rebecca Solnit's book, Hope in the Dark. <clears throat> in the 1960s, the Women's Strike for Peace was the first organized anti-nuclear movement in the US. And when they were interviewed, participants said that they felt that their efforts achieved nothing at the time. But in fact, they ultimately contributed to major victories like the ban on above ground nuclear testing, which was creating radioactive fallout showing up in mother's milk and baby's teeth. And this slide here shows an excerpt from an interview with one of those activists. So Solnit wrote, the woman from WSP told of how foolish and futile she had felt standing in the rain one morning protesting at the Kennedy White House. Years later, she heard Dr. Benjamin Spock who had become one of the most high profile activists on the issue, say that the turning point for him 
was spotting a small group of women standing in the rain protesting at the White House. If they were so passionately committed, he thought, he should give the issue more consideration himself. So this is a reminder that social change is hard to measure. Um, so the next time you hear Greta Thunberg giving some big speech before the UN, remember that she's just one single visible point resulting from the invisible work of thousands of unnamed people behind the scenes. Scientists, activists, journalists who brought attention to the climate story, the teachers who ignited her awareness, some anonymous passerby who maybe said an encouraging word to, to keep her going during her first winter of striking alone. And then of course, all, all of the youth climate strikers spreading and amplifying that message and having invisible impacts of their own, which are impossible to trace and may not be visible until years down the road. That should actually be reason for hope rather than discouragement. Because every time you have a conversation or share a book or inspire someone through your work, those actions may get multiplied by a larger community that you will never even meet. So I'll close with this quote from Margaret Mead. It's a line I've always loved. She says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I've also um, included my social media information here where I post new talks and workshops um, and information on new podcast episodes. So feel free to follow me if you want those updates. Um, and the one other thing I just really want to say, because, you know, normally if we were at an in-person conference, we'd be bumping into each other in the hall and we'd be able to have more informal conversations about this. And students often ask me, oh, are there research opportunities or internship opportunities with people who are doing this kind of work on the emotional impacts and mental health impacts? And the answer is yes. I'm actually working with um, an international team right now. We're just starting up um, a big um, toolkit that we're going to offer for climate justice activists and mental health professionals and educators around the world. Um, and so we are looking for um, students or they don't have to be students, other activists, if they want to be involved um, as interns or volunteers or research assistants, just reach out to me directly um, via email. You can find me on my website um, and I'd be happy to, to continue that conversation with you. So so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move to breakout rooms. You'll be with three or four other people. Um, and these are the two questions that I want you to discuss in those groups. Um, what is your primary dark emotion in response to climate change? Maybe you've never talked about it before. Maybe you talk about it all the time. This is gonna be perfect for you. You've got lots of practice. But think about how does that emotional impact um, or emotion impact your work? or what kind of symptoms can you identify? And then second, what strategies help you cope? And I think this is a really good opportunity to, to crowdsource some techniques, right? I, I gave you four tips, but I do not have all the answers. Um, so I think this is an opportunity to hear from each other what has worked in your own work and life. Um, and then we'll come back um, um, with about five minutes to go. So we'll have about 10 minutes for this, this breakout opportunity. And I'm gonna try to float around and just kind of listen in. Or if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. But I really just want all of you, I mean, I've been talking for 35 minutes, so I should stop and just let everybody else's voices be heard. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we'll, we'll um, copy this into the chat when you get into your breakout room as well. So um, I was only able to, to visit one of the, the sessions, but I just, I heard some, some really powerful testimonies of how um, not just grief and anxiety, but actual trauma and, and, and physical impacts have been um, <clears throat> experienced in, in people's lives in doing this work, but also in, in living in this um, world of environmental injustice and white supremacy and capitalism and environmental destruction. Um, but then the, the solutions themselves were also, you know, just powerful and, and very simple. And a lot of them, you know, came back again to time outside and time with each other community, right? So, and I think 
really those are the same things like nature is our community the non-human world is our community we've lost sense of that right but those also are our extended family and and net, uh, kinship networks and so that is just another way of thinking about spending time in community is spending time with with trees and green space and animals and bodies of water so it was really kind of beautiful to hear people talk about what that meant in their personal lives very happy to follow up with anybody individually if you want to email me or get in touch with me on social media i'd love to chat and um help you in any way that i can i'm uh i'm an instructor and an educator and i i I consider everybody to be my colleagues and my students and my teachers. My students are like my favorite teachers and, and the rest of the community and young people that I talk with. So um, I, I'm open to all of you um, if anybody's interested in continuing the conversation.